right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Uh, for our in-person audience, uh, we're excited to have you guys here. For our virtual audience, please click the share button, spread the word uh, of the stream. You can watch this on both our, the Jazz Museum in Harlem Facebook and YouTube channel, so you can check that out. Uh, for those of you in the audience, how many is it your fir very first time here at the museum? Amazing, wonderful. Thank you guys for coming out, we appreciate it. Um, I'll move this mic up so it's not quite so boom. Um, so yeah, for you first timers, we, we appreciate you giving us a chance. And uh, there's a, and we know there's a lot of things going on in New York City, but uh, we are small and mighty and we hope you will come back for future programs. We do about 100 public programs a year. Uh, during COVID, that has been a lot virtual, but we are slowly and steadily getting back to these in-person audiences, in-person events. So we really um, thank you guys for coming out and we appreciate you all um, for uh, keeping your masks handy too. Um, so uh, tonight's program is a continuation of a long running series we have here at the museum, Jazz and Social Justice. Uh, it allows us to look at how music and jazz in particular intersects with a lot of different areas of our, our, our culture and our world around us. And our host and curator for this series, um, You've read him in a lot of different places over the years, all the major jazz magazines, Wall Street Journal, um, Jazz Is, Jazz Times, and everything in between. Please welcome Mr. Larry Blumenfeld. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks for coming out. Um, I am Larry Blumenfeld. I love this place. I love this place, and if you don't already, you should too. Um, the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, um, because it's not just a place that enshrines legacy and history and art, but it's also a, a living space for a real culture, a living culture, a culture that has to do not just with great musicianship, but how we think and feel and act and what's on our minds, and that's a lot of what we're doing here. I've been lucky enough, the museums have been very generous to me for uh, 15 years or so, and I've done a number of different programs here, all involving music and conversation and sharing of information. This is the 17th edition of Jazz and Social Justice. I started this series in 2017 after the election, and partly it was, I remember being out in the street in marches and everyone felt a lot of passion but I, I realized there were a lot of different things that we were concerned about and talking about and and that these things needed to be considered each in their own context and that there were a lot of brilliant musicians that I knew who were also committed to or concerned with some of these issues so in past editions we've had music and conversation related to issues of environmentalism immigration policy, the incarceration state, um, the idea of a protest song. And um, tonight, Faye Victor, wonderful vocalist, composer, band leader, um, is really the spark for this, pro this edition, which is What Does Healing Sound Like? Um, as a vocalist, band leader, composer, and wide-ranging collaborator, Faye Victor has changed both the sound and context of experimental jazz. Um, you will get to hear something great tonight, and then you'll think, wow, that's not enough. I want to hear more. And what you can do is you can go to the Stone downtown at the New School next week from April 6th to 9th, where Faye will be doing a residency, a different context and different ensemble each night. If you go there, I'm sure we'll run into each other. Um, Faye's recent projects led me to talk to her about this. One, a Sirens and Silences project, she called a memory document composition, which used the tones and the sirens she heard outside her Brooklyn home when the pandemic started as the basis for a longer composition. We'll talk a little about that. Um, her Mutations for Justice project, which you'll hear some of tonight, I believe, is a rolling diary of the Trump administration and all that's followed using small compositional mantras to create what she calls chanting protest music as a mutable entity to change how we see. So tonight, 
Um, you'll hear Faye Victor along with bassist Luke Stewart and violist Men Melanie Dyer. After the music, Faye will talk to me and we'll be joined by another guest that I'll introduce later. Um, please help me welcome Faye Victor. And their thoughts. That's what we need. That's what thoughts. we need. Redemption. Prayers. That's what we Prayers need. Prayers for the loneliness of white, white wolves, wolves. And, their and, their and their thoughts. That's, That's what, what we need. Redemption. We need redemption from. from. And their thoughts. Prayers. For Prayers the for the loneliness of white of wolves, wolves and, and their, their wicked thoughts. thoughts. That's, That's what, what we need. need redemption, redemption from. from. Prayers. 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 Prayers for the lonely ass white wolves. Prayers for those lonely and their white thoughts. Wolves. And, and, that's what we need redemption from. Thoughts. That's what we need redemption from. Prayers that's for what the we need lonely. redemption from. Prayers for the loneliness of white wolves and their thoughts. Lord knows that's what we need redemption from. Mm -hmm. They're trying to keep all the brown people out. They're trying to get all the brown people out. They're trying to get all the brown people out. They're trying to get all the brown people out. They're trying to get all the brown people out. They're trying to get all the brown people out. They're trying to get all the brown people out. They're trying to get all the brown people out. They're trying.
if you're white, you can stay around. Thank you. wanted to talk a little bit about that piece. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, so as, as Larry mentioned, um, we're doing selections from my Mutations for Justice project, which was developed during the Trump administration. It's sort of a distillation of all the news we were getting. And for me, in the beginning of the administration, it was really clear that he wanted to alter the immigration in the United States. And so that's what that piece is kind of just sort of bringing it back down to what it's really all about, which is just trying to get black and brown people out of this country and keep them out. So that's what that was about. Thank you for listening to that. Um, this title, this one is called Stop Rationalizing the Madness.
Thank you. Woo. I don't think I need to explain that one, do I? <laughs> All right. I just need to grab a little water. Thank you for listening, everyone. Um, we're going to finish off with a piece that's actually not really part of this, of this um, project, Mutations for Justice, but I feel, um, I wrote it actually not that long ago, maybe a couple months ago, and I feel like it's really reflective of what we're going to talk about later, and it certainly connects with what we just did, so it um, feels like a great piece to, start with, to, to end with and to go into the conversation that's to come. Trust the universe. Trust the you.
Thank you. Luke Stewart on double bass. Melanie Dyer on viola. Thank you so much for listening to our music. And uh, see you very shortly. since moving to New York a dozen years ago or a decade ago from her native Israel. She's performed widely at Jazz at Lincoln Center and many other venues and has worked widely with 
um, clients doing music therapy. So without, do we have further ado? Maybe we have just a little bit of further ado. So, um, and it's kind of going to be an a, a, a nice open conversation, which at a certain point, I hope you'll join in in terms of any questions or just thoughts that you have about this. Because I feel like we are all healing from a bunch of things right now. And we're all clearly somehow interested in, committed to, and connected to music and, and a broader idea of culture. So how does that, you know, what does that mean? How does that happen? Um, I think there might be some general idea that music and art is good and healing in general, but I think there are much deeper and more finely nuanced ideas about that that, that we can get into. Um, I don't think we have any further ado, right? Uh, no, we're cool. Uh, this one's good for me. I'm good. You know, you can applaud one more time for Faye Victor, <laughs> Melanie Dyer, and Luke Stewart. Because I think they deserve another round. Um, Faye, you want to join us? And Noah, you want to join us? And you know, the idea of the connections between music and healing are you know, as old as music or as old as healing, but it's taken many, many, many different forms and especially courses throughout the history of the culture and the music that's celebrated in this museum. Of the many names I would throw out, I'd say Google Milford Graves, both for the musical value of what he did and his very deep scientific immersion into the science of healing and music. So, okay, so let's talk. So, Faye, if I could start by just asking you a little bit about this mutation series, which clearly you're processing and helping us work through certain things. Um, how, did, yeah, how did that start for you, and, and how are you experiencing it as it develops? Well, um, okay, so that started sort of in the middle of the 2017. Um, you know, the first year of the Trump administration. And um, I'm a native New Yorker, so f I've known Trump as an entity for a really long time. So the idea that he was president was troublesome for me. I'm using a, I'm, I'm euphemistic about that. It was troublesome. It was really, so, and also what I found difficult to process was he was so transparent. Like I felt like he was very transparent, very, he was saying exactly what he, wa what he wanted to do and, and that, that's what that stopped rationalizing the madness. Cause like, and, 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 and there was this period where people were just trying to say, oh, he doesn't really mean that. And, he do, and it was just so, um, and there was just all these, it, it, just, it, it just felt like, why is, is, why is anyone sort of acknowledging what's really happening? So I, I, I felt for my own sanity, first and foremost, and to cope, I needed to kind of uh, distill a lot of the messages um, to make sense of them for myself. And, um, and that it made me, inspired me to, to write a piece, a large work. And the work is uh, 45 small pieces in it for the 45th presidency. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, we don't shy away from any politics at all. And I actually am on the same page. But I think regardless of where you were politically, hey, the culmination of that presidency were those images of people storming our yeah. capital and someone dying. and. Wherever you are in your political thinking, we all experienced that as trauma. That administration became shared trauma. Um, now, I want to talk to you about that other project, si Sirens and Silences. Sirens si and Silences, yeah. Yeah, how, can you, yeah, can you put us in, in the room when you uh, started working on that. So, well, it's actually, I wouldn't say it's a project, it's, it's a piece, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a, um, a piece of around 24 minutes. A piece whose premiere got interrupted by the pandemic. Yes, and um, it's going it's to premiere May 26th at, at Roulette. Um, and, the, you know, when, when New York City was the epicenter of the global pandemic, and basically, at least for this country, the first place where we really felt it, um, I, to me, the sonic landscape of New York at that time was 
was very special. It just it was a um, it was a way I had never heard New York before. And there were lots of sirens. Uh, and I happen to live in a community with a lot of hospitals, a lot of different types of hospitals, Jewish hospitals, um, uh, Catholic hospitals. So, so the sirens are different. So I just decided to record them and, um, and then later on transcribe them. And I created a mode of those pitches and created a piece based on that mode. And the idea was to, like, how do you um, to create a memory document, but not a memory document, something that's evocative of something, but something that's actually a pitch related to the actual event. Right. And so that was the idea with this piece. Nice. Yeah. So when you're experiencing the, the sirens, mm -hmm. you're experiencing them as the horror and the alert, yeah. but also as the basis of the score. Yes. yes. Um, which is yes. really, in, I mean, I, I remember I lived through 9-11 in Brooklyn just across the river. And after that happened, for me, the soundtrack was just, waking up and going to sleep to the sound of low-flying helicopters. Oh. Re for, it just yeah. kept going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. And after yeah. a while, it just yeah. I, feels, it's oppressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And well, I did, yeah. I just before, did writing that piece, and I mean, we haven't heard it perform, but realizing that piece in however you've rehearsed it, yeah. did that, change your experience of what you went through? Yeah, it did. And, and what was really beautiful about it is the ensemble, it's a four-piece ensemble. It, it's completely instrumental. I'm not singing on it at all. Um, uh, and, and also, that was a really the challenge to think about what instruments would best represent the silence. So uh, it ended up being violin, cello, uh, trombone, and clarinet. Um, so that's the... Um, and then um, the all, all the musicians also lived in New York, so it became this shared experience. We were all living through the same experience. And what was really what was really healing and touching for me is then when I presented them the piece, they got they, they got what they heard. They understood it like it intrinsically understood mm -hmm. where it was and, and in their own memory it, it, it sort of made an impact. So that was really um, that was really powerful for me. And this, so we had this shared moment, even though we were all in different places of experiencing the same thing through this particular piece. And when when it is premiered, when people hear it at Roulette, will you be talking about that, or will there be something in the notes that let them know here is what this is? I think so. Yeah, it's it's going to be that hasn't been done yet, but I think so. It's 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 a it's a uh, a dual concert also and presented by the International Contemporary Ensemble. Um, yeah, so they will be definitely some, and if not, I will have a lot to say. Yeah. So Noah, thank you so much for joining us here. I. I know that you know you'd been a a musician and a composer for quite a long time before you pursued becoming a practitioner in music therapy. I'm interested to know like what what led you to that and what what and what motivated you to go in that direction. Um I've been asked this question many times. First of all, thank you, Faye. That was incredible. And thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to hear you. And it's always inspiring and therapeutic as a listener. And um, yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, in a way, my journey into music therapy came along with becoming a professional musician, sort of at the same time. I was always a musician in a way. Um, but becoming a therapist was really at the same time that I was really taking music more seriously. And I felt that I just wanted something that for me felt maybe more direct and less about me. Not to say that being a musician is only about, you know, but not to trash every musician or myself, you know, n n none of us. I don't think it's out of a selfishness. But for me, I felt a need to express something in a different way, in an outlet of putting it to the other and really finding a way to make music with another person that is not my music. I'm there to facilitate it. Um, there's, I mean, there's many ways that music therapy can happen, and we can talk about that too, but it's really about I'm there as a sort of a maybe vessel to help bring out a music from another person rather than as a performer, I'm making my own music or you know, expressing myself in the context of other people's music, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And I'm curious, when you started in music, did you start on piano, studying piano, and then take voice? Or? I was I kind of always sang, I think from right. really, really day one. There's recordings of me as a three-year-old 
girl singing Israeli songs that were like my favorite, um, my favorites. And then piano was kind of a must in my house. So every, uh, we're three siblings. So th the three of us studied with the same teacher and we all started really early. And uh, my sister is a professional pianist as well. And my brother, he's the only one who decided not to take it professionally, but he's actually super musical. So we all were kind of introduced to the piano. It was a given, we had to, we had to do it. So, you know, there's that, I grew up in a musical household too. And, train some and you know that's a there's experience that you have of learning music and making music and then you've had the experience of then you experience it as a performer but then was the exp your experience of music and your relationship with music different once you started doing working and studying as a practitioner in music therapy and being this vessel I think so I think I want to say absolutely yes um and now I'm trying to articulate why, but it's clear to me that it is. Um, I think in many ways it's a different expectations of the different expectations of what music should sound like or can sound like. Because the music that I make with my clients, or rather that my clients make, can sound really different than what you make as a musician, a professional musician. And it's still it has so much beauty in it, and it can sound really chaotic to any ear, you know, many ears. Uh, might not make any sense in a musical way if we're trained musicians, but I, you know, through the process of the therapy, I hear so much sense in it that I think it's sort of, uh, what's the word? In some osmosis, it happens to me now as well when I listen to any kind of music or make any kind of music. I don't feel like I need those aesthetics that I would maybe need before becoming a therapist, if that makes any sense. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Although it's interesting, some of the things you say about that music and the therapy and the clients, I hear and feel those same things about like oh, everything you did at the end of that last piece, which okay, maybe it has a relationship to scat singing, maybe it has relationships to a whole range of wordless vocals that we could start naming names, but really I feel like you're just being a vessel for certain things and, and I doubt you planned that. No, we didn't plan that. That wasn't <laughs> complete. That was an improvisation. We right. just planned where it would where it would be in the piece, but that's it. Yeah. So I mean, you're both not just musicians, but you're both musicians who are comfortable in improvising and in the languages of improvisers and worked with them. Is there some? I mean, I know there's something special about improvisation to me, and that's a loaded word that we could talk about. But is there something special in terms of the power and context of healing? and approaching difficult things that improvisation can touch? Um, I, 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 yeah, I wanna, say, I wanna say something a little bit about that. Um, it's gonna come, I'm gonna come at it from a, a different angle. Um, as a person, I'm, I, really, I really detest divisiveness. Yes. Um, and I'm always trying to figure out ways for people to connect and, and um, as a vocalist and within jazz, it can feel pretty divisive. You know, it could feel like, um, you know, vocalists could feel marginalized. Um, I've always made it a point personally to make sure I insert myself, but I know for a lot of, for a lot of vocalists that's not, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, but one of the, th as, a, as teaching improvisation, one of the things I stumbled on was this um, idea of a connectivity. Because I teach a lot of mixed ensembles. I teach a lot of uh, instrumental ensembles as well. So the idea of how can we bring ensemble, uh, uh, instrumentalists and vocalists together. And, I, and this exercise, and I start, and the way we start out is everybody uses their voices, no matter what instrument you play. Mm -hmm. And you, and we all start, because we all have a voice, right? So, and I've been doing that for a few years now, and the musicians, the people, the, the, the ensembles that I do this always feel super, and they always say they feel really connected after. They feel it was therapeutic and healing to start out um, on a journey with all, of, all their voices. Um, I'm guiding things, but that's how it starts. And then later on in the process, um, they can bring in their instruments, but, I, but the, when they do, it's really clear, I tell them that when you do bring your instruments, because we go into an improvisation, that the instrument, that when you bring it, it has to be in the continuum of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it needs to, and, and, um, and, and yeah, and so that's been a really therapeutic and fun thing. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, everyone says that when we when I've done this, that they've never done that kind of thing before. Yeah. And then you 
would think, why not? <laughs> um, There's so many things I wanted to say in regards to that. First of all, is that Faye, you're the I've done this workshop yes, with you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was incredible. And I th and I want to also mention in this context that it's really special for me to be here today because you're kind of my first vocal uh, hero when I moved to New York and I took some oh, lessons with yes, you indeed. and I, you were like the first vocalist that I went to see shows and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And you really opened my mind in that sense. Um, that's the one thing, the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing re in relation to, I don't know how much it's related, I guess it is related to our conversation, but in relation to what you were saying about the divisiveness, and mm -hmm. I think we talked about that in the past, how it's not just the device, di divisiveness of um, vocalist and you were saying vocalist and it's instrumentalist, right. but just like the term that is sometimes used, musicians versus vocalists, vocalists. Yeah. which <laughs> always oh. horrified me. Oh, and yes. I'm like, yeah. this, yeah. we're all musicians. Yeah. And yeah. But I, I had to say to that. Make the, to make the <laughs> distinction and say instrumentalist, mm -hmm. you know, and not, and not music, because the musician, if I say musician, I mean everybody. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. some but people true. won't include vocalist in oh, that term, not. and that yeah. is... That is BS. Yeah, anyway, so <laughs> sorry. It is. Um, and then speaking to your to your I think to your original question, Larry. Um, I think we all know. I mean, music can access those places that words can't, and this is the power one one of the powers that it has. And especially if we're talking in relation to trauma, trauma works affects those areas literally in our brain that are nonverbal. Uh, especially if it's it's a pre-verbal trauma, for example, a kid that hasn't learned how to talk yet and there's no way for them to even know to how to describe, but even adults, this is what happens in trauma. Therefore, wh where music works, that side of the brain is another side and it allows us this sort of bypassing of that area. And I think improvisation is really, it's not the only way, but I know for me in my work, that's many times the main way to go there. Um, to get to reach those areas, the nonverbal. And when you improvise as a musician, mm -hmm. which means either vocalizing or playing the piano, by the way, um, when you <laughs> improvise as a musician, does it somehow serve that same function for you to either yeah. release things that maybe you can't in your ordinary life and through your words? Absolutely. Um, I will give an, an example, I guess, speaking of trauma in Ukraine, there's, a, not to like self-promote, but I'm thinking of a song that I wrote in my, in my last album that is called Rovno, um, after a name of a town of my grandparents in Ukraine, what, what is now Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, when they were there, it was, I guess it was part of Poland. Mm -hmm. um, and they fled right before the war, luckily, because the rest of their family was murdered. So for me, that was a traumatic past. And this song was my way to process it. And I never really knew too much of that story. And we visited there t three years ago. And after that visit, my only way to process that visit and, and uh, that history um, was through music. So that music, that song was completely improvised at first until I got this melody. And then in the recording, there's a lot of improvisation around it. So right. that's just a one way that I use it. But I think a lot of, a lot of this stuff that I do, and I think that obviously that you do too, comes mainly, star starts as improvisation. Mm. Um, and then maybe you get through that, you find that one idea for those, either those words or, or those musical words. By the way, I was thinking you're, something really interesting in a lot of the stuff that you do with words, that is you repeat, mm -hmm. yes. repeat it uh, yeah. so many times until it kind of becomes yeah. part of your, yeah. your being, right? You can't leave the room without remembering those sentences. And I think that's also a big part, like naming, mm -hmm. right? That's part of the integration of trauma. So, yeah. Mm. I, I felt the it. same way and God, thank you so much for rescuing the term thoughts and prayers. <laughs> <laughs> because of course, that's what every oh, callous yeah. politician says yes, exactly. when he really means I'm not doing anything, but I can say these three words. Yes. But you kind of, and by repeating it over and over again with intention, I felt like, oh, now it's safe to say that and actually mean it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I did feel, so yeah, can you talk a little bit about, because I've, I've learned over time that repetition well, in a religious 
-hmm. ritual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or in a musical mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? In pop songs. In anything, in life, you yeah. load the dishwasher every morning for enough days. And but but what is how does repet? Clearly, you think a lot about repetition. Yeah, well, in, well, in this project, it's all about that because um, you know, the idea of a mantra, like mantras for change. So, mm -hmm. and and um, and no, I really, I, I'm really happy that you say for yourself that that like you feel that you can't leave the words, and that's that's actually the point, like to kind of. Um, Say the say the words over and over again, and so whoever's listening has to really think about what does that what does that mean, and 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 take it in. And I have to say, we we this group as a um, we performed on the Winter Jazz Fest in 2019, um, and at the end we sang Brown People out, the, the what I think was the second, well actually the first like musical piece we did, um, and the whole was audience like we were at SOBs about 300 people. They started they just started singing along with us. They started <laughs> chanting along, and that was. That's actually the dream I want for this particular project, where people start uh, uh, singing along and, and sort of just taking in the words and sort of making them, taking agency with the words for themselves. Yeah. So, so that's what that's about. I mean, I do about. feel like I, I talked at the top of this night about being in the marches in 2016, 2017. And in those months, I f did have this feeling of like, well, we have certain songs and certain mantras, but they're kind of old. Like, we don't. At that moment, I was like, we need some. We need some new ones. We need some ones yeah. that someone, and we're starting to get them, um, you know. But also, I feel like sometimes people, th well, immigration policy, and let's talk about the complexities of it. But you're <laughs> like, let me make it really simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Because, yeah, to me, that's what, yeah. what was happening. Yeah. Yes. Thank right. you. I mean, and, and simple for me in this case is good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, clear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put you two on the spot, but. Are there any particular experiences of music, either hearing it, being in an audience, or making it, that really stick out in your minds as like, this was a moment of release for me or for the people around me? Um, Alice Coltrane. Yeah, Alice Coltrane, like anything. Uh, um, uh, it's funny you say that, because I happen to be thinking and writing about her right now, but t can you talk just a little bit about why you say Alice? Uh, I just think that she was connected to something, um, like super, really mysterious, and and it just comes up in the music, even from the beginning before she, you know, became um, you know, started her ashram and everything. Um, I think it was the record Universal Consciousness. Uh, one of them. Yeah, I mean, there's there's many, but how many how many people here are familiar with Alice Coltrane's music and her? Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, so for me. Like from the from the first note, whenever I hear anything, it it feels like I'm being healed. You know? Yeah, okay. yeah, really. Yes, yeah, so that's the first person. I mean, I have it with others, but for her, with with her, it's 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 super powerful. And yeah. some some of it's just sonic, right? Oh yeah, because I know Ravi Coltrane has done her son has and John's son has done this program where he presents her music, and he has a harpist and a pianist playing the precise Wurlitzer yeah. organ that yeah. she used to play. And I know that he needs to replicate that exact sound yeah. for the ritual to happen. Uh -huh. right? I, I mean, I, yeah, actually mm. he has told me that. So yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, anything, any particular experience that you want to, even just listening to a recording that did that for you. Um, I feel like there's so many and I'm going to forget. I'm thinking actually a... <laughs> Off a fake concert, <laughs> not to put you again, <laughs> again uh, on the spot, but definitely a fake concert, William Parker concerts, definitely places of, of healing and community. Um, well, let me ask you something. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but okay. So with William, because I have had those experiences with Williams or groups too. Uh -huh. I don't want to get too clinical about it, but <laughs> can you talk a little bit about both as a musician? But also in your practitioner head, how that works when William that experience works when you sense something and feel something in William's performances. Is there any way you could describe what it is in terms of just as a musician or as a clinician? Mm. I know that's asking a lot. That's that's a really tough one. I'm thinking 
Well, I think the aspect of making music as a group, as a community, that is a huge therapeutic thing, and it mean, can be a therapeutic thing in itself if the conditions are safe, um, and if you feel welcome, if you feel heard, and I think from what I've experienced as a listener and and as a vocalist, it's always been this very open, safe space. Um, and when, then you're becoming part of this thing that is bigger than you. And you feel it even just as an audience. It's just, yeah, I don't, I don't really know if I can articulate it. I think that's the most I have. No, I'm so glad you said that. That means a lot to me because, you know, I've heard certain jazz musicians who are very famous and popular talk about um, jazz as democracy. And, <laughs> and, and no, it's a, it's a good metaphor and it works yeah, on a very yeah. simple level and it is very, very true. And, you know, because he's going to play what he, he has something to play and it's his thing and she has something to play and it's her thing and we all, but there's this deeper level of empathy and like for any real ensemble that either of you would be part of, mm -hmm. that would be good. Yeah. Is there a certain empathy and compassion that's necessary just to make the music work? I think so, yeah. And I agree. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and trust, I would say, trust. And then we can feel it. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I do, I feel that. Even, even sometimes from band leaders who have reputations as being mean, they still function with their groups mm. and project a certain thing. Um, yeah. So is there, well, we're in a very st strange moment. I mean, I'm sure we could say that at any point in human history, but I have a 13-year-old son, and he keeps telling me, I say, you know, I see them storming the Capitol, and I say, sorry, I don't know what to tell you. This never happened. And, or he'll have remote school, can't walk into a school for a year, and I'll say, sorry, I don't know what to tell you. This, I, I swear this never happened. Yeah. And, and now by now he's like, nothing ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> but really, it, it, we sort of, rolling pandemic, rolling invasion that we can't make sense of, um, thoughts about the fiber of democracy in our country may be coming apart. Can music speak to this moment in a way that's more than just a balm or making you feel a little better? Oh, wow. Can yeah. music, well, maybe make, make the question more specific. Can music dig into some of these things that are vexing us? How do we live in a multicultural society? Um, how do we deal with the threat of a pandemic without just closing up? Can, can music unlock some of the answers to those things in a meaningful way? I'm let you start with that one. <laughs> I'm thinking just maybe it's a philosophical question, but is it the role of music to unlock and like give the answers or is it our role to just talk about those things with our music and make sure people actually think about them and experience them because more than that is beyond our, I don't, I think it's beyond our reach, and it, it, sh and it should be. I don't think it's the role. I don't know. Yeah. What do you no, think? No, that sounds like. Yeah, I don't. I agree. I don't. I don't think. I mean, I think we can offer something. Yeah. yeah. But how it lands is totally not in our control. Yeah. Um, but maybe it can change the frame. Mm. That word. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I, if I can share just something very quickly um, about speaking of William, um, I once wrote a piece uh, called. Uh, um, Patients waiting for William about uh, Peter Kovold, who was a bassist who um, who actually died at William's house waiting for him. Mm -hmm. So I I was so moved by that story of two bassists, so such close friends and so much love for each other, that I wanted to write um, write a piece about that. And so I wrote about him waiting, and mm -hmm. and I and I made the decision to write from the vantage point of the bassist who was dying. Anyway, I did that at a concert in San Francisco, and afterwards, um, a woman came up to me and she shared that she saw her mom dying while her father was taking care of her mom, and she said she never heard a piece of music that represented that so well for her. Mm -hmm. And she and we cried, like she started wow. crying, I started crying, 
And uh, that's the only time I can say where I, where I know I know something I did really resonated with someone to the point where it helped them heal. Um, In a way that words might not have. Yeah, I yeah. just, last night, I was at the Stone, where, by the way, you can hear Faye Victor next week. <laughs> um, um, and it was this marvelous group that included Bill Frizzell. And not long ago, a trumpeter and cornetist, Ron Miles, oh, passed yeah. away. At, far too young and very suddenly he was very important in Bill's band Bill was very important in his band and Bill and some of the members of that band just played a concert at the Big Eaters Festival I asked him well, what was that like and yeah, he told me just last night this story of Ron's widow had sent him some music mm -hmm. and it was dated the morning of his death oh, and it was wow. what he was writing the day he died Oh my and goodness. they played that music, Whoa. And, and they just they improvised and built on whatever was on the page. And he was talking a little bit about how yeah that that served a purpose that nothing yeah. else. The music that Ron left that day was That's beautiful. Gift. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's still blowing my mind. By the way, that brings me back to the question of a concert that I watched that was healing. Definitely Ron Miles Band in Vanguard, like one of the first concerts I think we I saw after a lockdown. It was one of the most wonderful healing experiences, actually. It was devastating. And if you can leap the paywall at the Wall Street Journal site, you'll read my article about that. I went to that first set. And you know what I loved about that? Ron was a kind of introverted guy. And he did, it was the first, now Vanguard had been closed for 18 months. And this is like, you know, the Vatican being closed or there's Mecca is closed. And, um, and that first time, Ben Ron said very little. They just played the music and the music served the function. And it really was, you know, people just looked at each other. I never forget that night because we were wearing masks, so you really just saw each other's eyes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was incredibly, that was incredible. I, I remember, I love the drummer and composer Tyshawn Sori, and I heard him at the Jazz Gallery, and I didn't know it would be the last gig I would hear for like 18 months, but it was right before they closed yeah. things down. But it was the day after McCoy, or two days after McCoy Tyner died. And so it was like this long, connected set, at the very end of the set, they went into Bokoi Tyne or two without announcing it. And, and so first of all, it helped deal with Bokoi Tyner is dead. But then it helped deal with, okay, that's the last thing I heard. Yeah. At least I could hold that, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was really, that was very powerful. There's a reason why William Parker's name has come up a lot, partly because he's just one of my estimation one of the great living musicians and composers, but also because he and Peter Kowald and Patricia Nicholson were, were instrumental in creating something called the Vision Festival, which is a very important annual gathering. And I know it's important to all. That's a healing space, isn't it? It's a very healing space, yeah. And in, in what way? Well, you know, it's a, it's a community that has felt like it wasn't didn't always feel accepted, and there's so much openness and so much permission given to what a performer can can do there. Yeah, um, you know, many of the acts are improvised or, or free, you know, almost. So that's that's what makes it very healing. And then um, there's just this really strong sense of community and coming together. And I have to say, outside of the festival, there is a lot of things that go on um, connecting, keeping keeping the community connected. You know. Um, I will say last year, Amina Claudia Myers was a lifetime, uh, and that night for me was, that was a very healing night. Yeah, uh, um, Amina just had this m amazing force and power that was over the whole space that entire night. And, and that was at Pioneer Works. Um, and, and I even said to Patricia, I said, Patricia, I've never felt an energy like this at the Vision Festival, and she, she agreed. She was like, yeah, I, yeah. She said something very special about that night. But in general, it's just that, that sense of permission and that sense of, um, and also I think a lot of people from that community don't feel seen and, and feel like they live on the margins anyway. So it's a way of coming together and, and, and feeling included and feeling that um, whatever you do as a musician, even if you may not have a big name or something, it's valid. So you know, I, I was recently talking to this, another 
fine vocalist and composer Ganavia, mm -hmm. and was who was born here but of Indian descent and a very traditional Indian family. And she was talking to me about rituals that she grew up being part of and now being a performer and how the idea of performance is complicated for her. Um, and maybe not in a bad way, but just in a way. And yeah, I'm curious to know as a, now that you are a practitioner and have gone down this path of formally working in, does that change your intention or your experience of performing? Um, <laughs> Faye's like, oh, you're dealing with the hard questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just fascinated. Um, These are the big money questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think, uh, how do I answer this? and not sound obnoxious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like just there's some maybe attunement, I want to use the word attunement, and tuning in to fellow musicians or, to f or even to like an inner place that I feel is maybe more kind of, you know, the volume, the knob is turned up a little higher when you're a therapist because you really need to be present and really be aware in every kind of every moment what's going on with your clients to see that everyone is safe, to see what they need, especially if you, uh, of course, if you work with one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but I also run a lot of groups and there's a lot of kind of information to integrate in every, in every moment. So that I feel like that translates into the music making with professional musicians too. Um, which also feels weird to make that devices versus like the, the clients versus the professional musicians because some of the people I work with are incredible musicians regardless of their, you know, they're not maybe being ever paid to, to mm. play music, but they make incredible music. Um, but yeah, that, uh, that level of just maybe tuning in in a, in a kind of more immediate and intense way, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like it translates in, in, at least I hope most of the time uh, in other ma music making as well, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't like BS no. on stage or, <laughs> or not on stage. So <laughs> people got to be real, you know, in the music <laughs> in the moment. And of course, it's a kind of a, it's a life work. It's it's not an easy thing for anyone, even if you've been improvising your whole life. There's always going to be that's like something happens, our attention is for a second is is away, and maybe we're not noticing what the drummer just did, or maybe we're, you know, these things can change, but I feel like it's a life work. I guess both of them, as a musician and as a therapist, it's a life's work. I hope this answers in any way your question. <laughs> no, it, 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 it does, and I, I imagine that it's made you a little more finely attuned to the BS that might be there. And just maybe even. So, um, so Faye, you mentioned something earlier that's interesting, which is you work, you know, you you work with students, mm -hmm. and that in some way there's a therapist function or mode. Yes. Yeah. How, how can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, as a vocal teacher, I feel like the voice is so personal and so vulnerable for for many people for for many of us. And, and, and working with a teacher, you can really derail a person if you're not cognizant of, of um, where they are and what's going on. And, and I've, I've had it many times in, within a lesson where a student may start crying, you know, express a lot of emotion, um, and I always say, make space for that. And, and I just, so I feel like as a, as a vocal teacher, you are kind of a part-time therapist. I mean, not as a, not, not, uh, not as a, you know, practitioner as a, as a studied practitioner, but it's it just sort of comes with the job. There has to be that sort of sensitivity to um, the person that you're interacting with and watching when things. Um, also, it's just sort of inevitable. There's, there's some things I might want to say as a teacher that are that maybe need to be said, and trying to figure out the best way to say it. You know, so that it doesn't so that it lands well and doesn't cause maybe any 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 trauma or any kind of. Um, so, uh, because that that era of um, like teachers sort of yelling at you and um, that's 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 not okay. That's really not okay, and I'm I'm not an advocate of that. And 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 I've I've had a lot of students over the years come 
come and say and, and express that kind of frustration and also deep sadness and pain from working with teachers that weren't weren't sensitive to who they were. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I cried at least in one lesson with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember sure. it, but I'm sure it yes. happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably more sad. <laughs> Or some emotion. I don't know if sadness is the, the the feeling, but definitely something very emotional because I think it's true. The voice. I think every music teacher, everyone who teaches an instrument, e even <laughs> or yeah. uh, any kind of music or instrument, or voice, whatever, there's always going to be elements. If at least if you're a good teacher, right, you're going to have to be attuned to your student. There's a lot of psychology around that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of feelings. People might feel insecure. People feel. Like like you said, they had experiences of, of bad teachers in the yeah. past that were putting them down, or they're just you know all these experiences that can come through a, in the music lesson, but in the voice even more so. And I think part of it is trauma. If we're talking about you know trauma is is in the body, it's embodied, and and the voice is the most direct thing. So sometimes just starting to use the voice activates thing and things and maybe connects us to subconscious things that we weren't even aware of and maybe you've had those experiences of people like starting to cry and not even knowing why exactly and it might have been that thing that oh and then they might even reveal that uh, something about themselves that they didn't know just because they were singing with you yeah. and that's really it really has happened a lot yeah you know i've worked for many years you know doing a lot of kind of writing some of it's just reporting or interviewing musicians, but some of it is what you'd call a critic. And I don't love that word. And there is a lot of, there are a lot of people who do that work and a lot of people who read that material who want good, bad, thumb up, thumb down. And, and I understand that. that much? Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, on the one hand, I do understand that, you know, things are bought and sold and consumed and whatever, and there's a function. And, and there's a long history of great critics who do that, but in a deep way with a lot of context. But I do feel like, you know, there's the, the good, bad thing we could talk about. But then at a certain point, if I really love music, I feel like the real distinction is, is it honest or dishonest or somewhere? Like, where is it on the honesty scale? Is this going to touch me because, you know, I mean, I could uh, listen to you and relate something you did to Betty Carter, which I think is high praise. But at a certain level, it's no, it's communicating to me something very honestly in a way that caught me, you know? I mean, I do you, and at which I feel like, you know, a lot of the therapeutic model is based on getting to so, through past some dishonesty and <laughs> to honesty. Yes. Um, yes, that's so huge. I've, yeah, yeah, I mean, is that, is that part of the power of what we're talking about? Oh, yes. I think so. I think so. And it's, and it's uh, yeah, personally, yes. And, and also um, with, 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 you know, with teaching people, I think it's, it's really a big thing. Um, but it's not easy for everybody to get to that place. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that can come in, and that can right. create. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> and, and we're <laughs> no. trained to do something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the music really exists there. Like, you know, it, when, if we... Um, get to that place um, where we feel comfortable to express who are our authentic selves, which I know is a bit, um, but you know, authentic selves in the sense of who, how we really feel. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a, you know, as sort of a, as a journey, that's an incredible place to land. Well, who you, you really are. So, who you really? I know some people throw around the term authentic self, but I know <laughs> you're really meaning it. Yeah. yeah and I so, know. all right, the way you sang at the end of that little set. Yes. Did you have to reach a point in your life where you allowed yourself to sing that way? Oh yes, oh yes. I mean, I, I mean, yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I started out as a you know mainstream jazz vocalist, and um, the big change for me leaving that, like sort of starting to move, was the acknowledgement that for me a lot of the lyrics were terrible, <laughs> and I'm talking about things that you know I wanted to talk about other things. I shouldn't have used the word terrible. I shouldn't. I'll take that back. Um, they didn't speak. To they you. didn't speak to me. <laughs> Um, and uh, and I and I felt like there were other things to talk about, and and taking the step to actually do that was was sort of going towards being honest for myself. So now I want you people to speak to us. Is there? Do you have any questions for any of us, or any just thoughts you'd like to share about any of this? That things you want to speak to or clarify. You can just stand up or shout it out or. 
whenever you want. That. Yeah, I, I just I think thank you for saying that, and I think it's, it's, you raise an interesting point. I think as an artist, I'm all, I, I think I'm I try to play with I'm always trying to play with how you can combine things, and I I, I agree a lot of uh, the the pieces, especially the first three were really you know, um, but that last piece to me um, was not was not really and 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 that last piece was kind of used as a segue into. Um, and I made that kind of decision to kind of how to you know to try to go from like being like Rah! to kind of okay um, more subtle, more sort of connected, you uh, know, in, in a sort of a more sensitive way, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, but I would also say that I think one of one of the things that's really interesting to play with, at least for me as an artist, is how are the how are the many different ways I can say something, and maybe it maybe it can be declared out in the way, but maybe it's also can be done said in many different ways. So that's something I like to play with. How you know, exp I call it experiments in communicating message. Like how can you communicate the the thing you want to say? Um, and sometimes it you know lead you know it could be pr like a protest into a healing space. So you know, so th that's what I would like to say. But thank you for bringing it up because it's a really good point. I think. Do you have any thoughts about that? No. So. I, I, I really love that question. I have some thoughts I want to share about that because, you know, we're talking about complex things and complicated truths, which are, they have a lot of facets to them, and it's not this or that. And I think, yes, you're absolutely right that there are modes in which healing and anything therapeutic must avoid conflict and there are aspects to protest that is all about conflict. And for instance, like I was just listening to a recording by Abdullah Ibrahim, a great South African pianist, who lived through apartheid and was part of a political process. I think he might have been exiled for a while and was part of a, an active resistance to apartheid that his music and other people's music was part of. Yet, if you ever hear Abdul Ibrahim, especially solo, and you should while he's alive, it's just this immersive, healing thing that makes all of that go away yeah. and, and will make a room silent. And it's magical. Now, I've had the experience where those two things you were talking about were absolutely conflated. They were very, so after Hurricane Katrina and the flood, that was the result of levee failures. Mm. Um, after that happened, I went down to New Orleans and I was really just gonna report about what happened here. There's a great city of culture, it's underwater. What's gonna happen to these musicians who are cast out? If the, it's, you know, the great opera halls of Italy were underwater, we'd all be up in arms. So I went down, there was a lot I didn't understand. There was a lot I did not know. When I was in the very first second line parades with brass bands and people behind them, and people dancing, I learned very quickly that it was two things at once. It was the, I mean, on CNN, for 90 seconds, it looked like, wow, these people, even though they suffered so much, they can still party and play, you know? Yeah. And that's what it was. But what it really was, it was two things at the same time. It was these people who had been given one-way tickets out, who were not getting their aid, saying, these are our streets. 
This is how we reclaim these streets. And this isn't even me, this is them telling mm -hmm. you this. This is, our political protest looks like this, but also it was their therapy. It was their healing. It was Lil Liza Jane, an old folk song, or Feel Like Funkin' It Up. When that happened, and a tuba, and a bass drum, this was their, I mean, again, mm -hmm. this had to be explained to me, and then I had to experience it in real time. But it was really, it was, it was amazing. And I, honestly, I couldn't have imagined that combination. But I will never forget it, and it was very real, and it was both things at the same time, which is a, something I've learned from this music, your music, the mu you, that this music holds many truths, yeah. some opposed truths at the same time, and manages to do it better than Fox News or CNN. <laughs> um, yeah. as, so I have a question for you, any of you, if you care to answer and you don't have to. Do, is there an experience that you've had of music that was especially healing or helped you process some trauma in any way that you want to share? And again, you don't have to. Any other questions that you have for anybody, or just thoughts? Yeah. I do have a question. Okay. I just wanted to thank you for sharing, mm -hmm. especially like coming down and creating music about Black trauma and Black pain. Mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful. Um, well, <clears throat> wow. Um, I feel like we've always done that, you know? I feel like we've always done that. It's, it's, I feel like it's kind of in the DNA, you know, of, 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 our, of our existence. And, um, and, and, you know, like when you, when you, I know, like when you made the comment about how CNN was saying, oh, look at all this trauma, and that, that was really triggering for me, actually. It was really triggering because it's, it, 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 it feels, um, it feels racist. Yeah, it's actually, because, it, 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 but, and, and I think that, that we, um, as a community, have you know have had to face a lot of horror and trauma, and and still within that, even if it's in the, whether it's in church, um, or whether you know at a, at a dinner, at a, at a at a cookout, or whatever, how we express, um, how we we make sure that we we figure out a way to to enjoy our lives. Um, and I think I don't know if that really answers your question, but to me, it's just like it feels like it's such a live thing that we have to constantly navigate. Uh, and actually, I want to say one thing. Has anybody here heard of the Hakka? Hakka, it's, it's, a, um, it's a dance of the, it's a, actually not a dance, it's a, it's a tribal ritual of the Maori people of uh, New Zealand. Um, and to me, that's a real pow powerful conflation of protest and, and therapy. Because that, that's a dance, that, that's a, a body, do you know, do you know, anyone knows what that is? So it called, it's a, um, it's actually, I don't, I don't want to be accused of appropriation, so I don't want to do too much. But, <laughs> but, um, but it's kind of like where they're, um, uh, huh, like that, and they kind of use their voices like that, and and they, and it's a way of kind of like casting out uh, spirits, and and there was a really beautiful haka after there was a mass, there was a mass shooting in New Zealand maybe four or five years ago, and there was a beautiful haka in response to that, um, and so I wanted to kind of mention mention that because that's a very and I, I talk about the haka a lot because when I'm teaching vocal technique, I, I use that yeah. for people to get into their bodies. I I, that. <laughs> right, that, that sort of, that sound. Can everybody do that? Huh! Like just from your gut, like make that sound, see how that feels. Can everybody do that? Just try it. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> One, two, three. Huh! Yeah. <laughs> How'd that feel? That's <laughs> good. All right, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what's your name? Um, I'm so glad you asked you that and the way you asked it because, I mean, I think a lot of people have recognized that truth, especially about any music or co of the black diaspora. But there's other examples, but, but in a way that often trivializes it, like, oh, ringing joy from pain. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was one, a long time ago, I was at a conference in Istanbul, mm -hmm. and there was a scholar there who raised his hand and said, I'm curious to know, we had slavery in the Ottoman Empire. How come we didn't get jazz? And he, oh, he asked oh that, my goodness. but he meant that question. Um, but then there, I mean, this really happened. 
but but then then there's <laughs> but there's like if you listen to Billie Holiday, I mean you could talk about her phrasing and relate it to Louis Armstrong, and that's a really interesting conversation. You could talk about her pitch and how she uses it, but really it's like you listen to that, and then I mean that's a good you know that's a good example of what you're talking about. The more you talk about it, maybe it doesn't make as much sense. But I experienced, like I, for a long time, I didn't know, understand why Billie Holiday's vocals hit me. I was, tr I trained in, as a vocalist when I was young. I was like, well, she's not quite singing right, mm -hmm. you know? But and why does that hit me? And it took me a long time to understand. And also it took me a long time that I can't mimic that. I could do something from my own mm -hmm. suffering or joy or I could be like a Saturday Night Live sketch. <laughs> you know? These are about eight years ago. I don't know. I'm not good at the time like that. The Metro North train where there was a car on the track. And yeah. Passed, yeah. Four or five people were killed. Yeah. And I remember and that. And it was in the news and everything. And they described everything else. And then one afternoon I was at work and they released the names of the people. And I looked at them. Not many I got up and just had to walk around and give them hard facts like that. Particularly since it had been a news story before I realized it hit me so closely. Yeah. And I, I mean, there wasn't a funeral and the, the body was, you know, it was, yeah. And that Saturday night I went to, I love Saturday night, and, but I went, I went to visit Eugene Baylor with some friends from family. Jean Baylor took me to the church and she was up there That's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Anyone else have a question or a thought that you want to share or throw at us or throw out at the room? Um, I don't, I, I never sit here and talk about my own writing, but just this conversation has led me to say that there's a piece that I wrote that you can find for free at a website called Zocalo Public Square, Z-O-C-A-L-O, Public Square. And someone asked me to write a piece during the pandemic, and it's sort of about where we're talking leads to that. And yeah, I'd completely forgotten. Like that piece I started with after 9-11, you know, we didn't have the all news all the time, but we did have CNN and cable news, and we, information wasn't easy to get, and it didn't know how to feel, what to do. And Charles Lloyd, the great tenor saxophonist, was supposed to play the blue note. And he stuck around in town, and like five days later, his band played the blue note, and went to the blue note, and no lyrics, no words. And that, you know, I'd been all week long, I'd been trying to find something someone said that would make me understand or feel better. And that was the closest I came. And that was, you know, it was like the smoke was still coming across the river. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess I'd forgotten when we first were talking about this. Wow. So is this, all of this tonight, is this in any way therapeutic or healing for any of you? <laughs> I hope so. Um, and I, I agree with what you said, Noah, that it's not the place of the therapist or even the musician to give you the answers. But I do think that culture, like the good version of what we mean by culture, can give you a path, right? Um, do we probably have to stop, but do either of you have anything else you wanna say before we have to stop? I just wanna say that it's been great to be here and have this conversation. This is a really important conversation to have, and I'm glad that you started this, Larry, and thanks for asking me to thank join you. in. Thank you. Please help me thank Faye Victor, Noah Fort. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank Ryan Maloney and the Jazz Museum in Harlem. The past two years have made me realize just how precious it is to sit with people like this and just how precious it is to have a place like this 
where culture is living and talked about. So let's all think about how precious that is. Um, and yeah, uh, what she said, like the whole idea here is not a conversation and it's like, I hope this conversation go, I don't know, on your, in your table or in your feed or however you choose to communicate these days. Please just let strands of this conversation go out there and see what happens. I also, just one more time for Melanie Dyer and Luke Stewart who played so beautifully here. Oh yes, I'm sure you. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. I forgot about your, your residency and now I'm a whole schedule spot because I got I got a history of this. <laughs> What's your name? Really nice. I'm Dale. Dale, Dale. Rossi. You know, I wanted to